Brewing Business, Episode 2. This colonial-style brewery will really bring you back to the original 13 colonies. Dave Lopez of Gunhill Brewing Company really brings out the patriotic theme of his brewery. As a former U.S. military member, I cannot thank him enough for really entrenching the spirit of America in his brewery. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Brewing Business, where brewing, business, and beer collide for yet another epic show. Join your host, Tim Nichols, as he talks with today's top brewers and brewery owners. Mash the barley, boil the wort, add a dash of hops, sit back, and grab a beer. Cheers. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here on the Brewing Business Podcast. Today's guest, Dave Lopez, is from the Bronx in New York City, a semi-pro baseball player turned brewer and manager of the Bronx Thunder Dogs. Dave, I gave you just a little bit of an introduction, so why don't you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about you and the brewery. Sure. So uh, my partner, Kieran, and I, we started this, we started Gun Hill Brewing Company uh, just under a year ago, uh, we opened up in February of this past year, at the end of February. So coming up very quickly on our one-year anniversary. I live in New York City. My partner lives uh, just outside the Bronx, and we are we currently operate the first production brewery in the Bronx uh, since 1961. There have since been um, other breweries that have opened this year, but we were the first in the Bronx since 1961. So it's been uh, it's been a very very busy year for us. Wow, the first brewery opened in the Bronx in 53 years. Now you guys have some big shoes to fill, but it sounds like you guys are getting after it and you guys are going to hit it hard. Yeah, it was uh, it's it's been it was a, a something that we could definitely hang our hat on, and especially after we've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm not sure fami- how familiar you are with what's been going on in New York, but. Over the last two years, has been a big boom, as there has been everywhere in the country, but particularly in New York City. And a lot of that was in Brooklyn or in Queens. And so the Bronx is kind of like the last frontier. And so to be able to say that we are, or we were the first, um, it was something that we were very, very, very proud of. Now, I know a lot of our listeners have never been to New York. Can you kind of explain how that whole system works, you know, between Queens, Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, New York City? Sure. So each of those are considered a borough uh, that comprise New York City. Um, but I think that each borough has its own unique identity and there's a lot of pride in the individual boroughs. So for us, for example, opening up in the Bronx, there's a ton of Bronx pride because a lot of times the Bronx kind of feels like it's people in the Bronx feel like it's part of the forgotten borough, I think, a lot of times because a lot of businesses haven't really uh, been paying as much attention. There's been a lot of business that's opened in, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn has been a hotbed for, for a lot of different things. And so um, people are very, very loyal to their own borough, and they take a tremendous amount of pride in, in what goes on there, and whether it means you know repping some sort of clothing or drinking local or whatever it is. And so, but at the end of the day, everyone is part of New York City. So, um, we all fall under the the same roof, and we're all trying to accomplish the same things here in making New York City beer um, stand out. Uh, so there, there's sort of like a there's a team aspect to it in terms of from a from a brewing standpoint, but at the same time, there is also a very very localized aspect of it. It's great to hear a story where there's just tons of camaraderie going on. It just seems like today's day and age, it's hard to come by. It's it's actually been uh, it's been a really really refreshing to see that over the course of the last year, uh, particularly because my partner and I we come from a, a different background. We we weren't in the brewing industry before, so in our previous um, forays into business, we it's it's a lot more competitive. I would say, and not that the brewing industry isn't competitive, because obviously everyone's competing to get shelf space or tap handles or whatever it might be, but there is still a, a sense of, hey, if you need a favor, you call someone up and they're willing to do it because it's, a, it's all for the greater good. So a lot of these breweries have just crazy names behind them, and I was checking out your website, and it's pretty patriotic. So is there a, a story behind Gun Hill? There is. So um, there's 
there's two stories behind it. The first one is, so we, we, my partner and I are both from New York City. Uh, He was born in the Bronx. I was born in Manhattan. Um, I was schooled in the Bronx my whole life until I went to college. My partner went to college there. We have a lot of ties to the Bronx. So we really wanted to have a very New York centric name. And so we were trying to come up with a short list of names that would really stand out. And if you are driving on, um, I-95, which is obviously a major thoroughway here, and also another local highway. There's two. Each one of those has a very prominent exit that is called Gunhill Road. And so if, if you've ever driven there, you know Gunhill Road. You, the name resonates with you. Um, and if you're from the Bronx, it really resonates with you. But most people know if you say, oh, Gunhill, oh, you're in the Bronx. So we were, we were trying to find a name like that that had a lot of New York significance and um, we were looking into things, and Gunhill happened to have Revolutionary War significance because during um, a battle, um, I, I couldn't tell you the exact name of the battle. I'm not sure that there was a specific name for this particular battle, but it was in the Bronx, and the colonists took all of their ammunition, their guns, their cannons, and they pushed it onto this hill, which is in a cemetery called Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, there are actually a, a lot of old New York City brewers that are buried there. Um, but it, there, this cemetery, there's a hill that overlooks the area, and the colonists set up the, set up shop there, and the British started attacking and walking up this road that was then known as Kingsbridge Road. The colonists fired down on them, and the British started retreating back on the road, and they the road was renamed Gun Hill Road because the guns were up on this hill that led up to that the road led up to. And so when we were looking for locations and we were pointed in the direction of this of our current space, we were about uh, two hundred yards away from the corner of Gunhill Road. And so we sort of were like, okay, that's a pretty obvious sign that that has to co- that has to be the one from our short list gun hill um and then we took all of the revolutionary significance behind it and said that would make a great story for us and and we can use that imagery and and really get behind it so our our tasting room we have a lot of revolutionary war imagery we have american flags um that are older looking american flags from the colonial days um we have a, a very uh, old school feel in our tasting room, and we try and do that with all of our branding, and so that's that's the story behind it. Awesome, and I'm a huge history buff, so that's uh, that's great to hear that you guys are doing something. You know, especially one of my favorite eras is the uh, the colonial times, going up to like the Civil War and stuff like that. So that's great. Yeah, and you know, we try we try also as much as possible to to name our beers um, after. So we had a Revolutionary Red Rye. Um, we had um, a wheat beer called uh, Schuyler's American Wheat, and Schuyler was the wife uh, of an American general who she was burning wheat, her all of her wheat, to prevent the British from getting it in upstate New York. So we try and come up with with names of things for our beers that have that tie into that as well. So before the name, you had to obviously make the beer. So what got you started home brewing? So I, I actually have never home brewed. Um, before my partner has never home brewed before, um, so we we weren't really from in, uh, like I said we we didn't really have anything to do with the whole brewing process. What what sort of got it started, and I guess I'm sure you you were going to ask me this at any point, so I may as well just get into it now. Um, one of our teammates um, on our baseball team was a home brewer, and he brewed his own beer uh, for his wedding, and that's sort of what where this whole, this whole idea started, um, about five or six years ago. And I said to him, I said, this is, this is really good stuff. Have you ever thought about selling it? And he said, he said, I have, but I don't really have the time. And I said, well, if you ever decide you want to do it, let me know because I think I could find some people that could help and, uh, get you going. And then I got a call a couple of years later um, from him and said, Oh, remember when you said that? And that's how, that's how this whole process 
this sort of started. So I can, if you want me to keep going on, on everything, I can. But if, but that sort of answers your homebrewing question. I never did on any homebrewing, but it was a home brewer that that sort of pushed us into this. It is very different that you haven't homebrewed before, and everybody that I've talked to before this has actually had at least some sort of background in homebrewing, if not that they're the brewmaster of their own brewery. But this is really cool, and I think this is really a positive thing more than a negative thing going into this business. Well, I, you know, I, I think the the reality of it is is that a lot of home brewers they do um, they do a great job, and and um, I just like my partner and I we just liked drinking the beer, and then we looked at it and we sort of said, well, we really want to do something different with our lives, and what kind of bit we'd always joke around. I mean, I've known him for 12 years. We've, we'd always joke around and be like, oh, what could we do so we could leave our jobs? What kind of company could we start? And then we started looking, and as we talked to this other teammate of ours who was, who was the home brewer, we started looking further and further into it, and we're like, this is a great industry, and we're think, we think we're at the right time. So we can bring something a little different than just the brewing background to, to this and really help us establish a company and a brand um, and we need to get in as long as we have a good product. And so that's sort of what drove us a little bit more than, than saying, Oh, I think I make really good beer and I want to do it for, for a living because a lot of people make really good beer on a small scale. And I think, you know, we could have easily started practicing and, and cause it's really interesting and really cool. And everyone loves to be able to say, Hey, try some of this beer that I made. I mean, people do it all the time when they make, when they make food and they go, Oh, you got to try. I made this, I had this great recipe and I, made this great cake or whatever it is. Um, so we could have tried to do that, but it's sort of, we wanted to do it. Um, and, and we brought it, we wanted to have a different spin on things. So that, that's sort of where we came from as opposed to just going from the homebrew aspect. Right. And I think that could be great as far as the business aspect goes. Cause I know a lot of homebrewers probably just get stuck in this homebrew mindset where they're trying to make great beer. But when you start getting into the, the like the business and managing aspect of it, you kind of need somebody like you to really, you know, hone everything in and, you know, do the proper marketing and whatnot. So, yeah, you know, we, we have an interesting, uh, dynamic in our brewery because my partner and I kind of oversee the business. And then we have a, a brewer that we hired who, who's been in the trade for over uh, around 24, 25 years now. So he's been doing it a very long time. He, he's got a very good reputation. He does a very good job. But obviously, as you'd expect, there's the creative aspect and then there's the business aspect. And there's definitely, um, we can, from taking a step back, we can see where there or sometimes is, um, where or how a home brewer opening a brewery could sometimes get stuck because you need to sometimes take a look at the bigger picture and it might not always uh, point you in the direction that the creative aspect wants to go or says you should go, but sometimes you have to pass up short-term ideas and short-term gains in order to, to secure longer-term goals and, and longer-term gains for the company. So exactly where were you before you started the brewery? So um, I my background is in finance. Um, I, I have worked in uh, financial services and sales and trading. Um, I actually, I still currently have my job in, in financial services. Uh, I work for an investment bank here in, in New York City. Uh, so I do, I guess you could say I have two jobs. And I do a lot of work for the brewery in my free time and evenings and and during lunch breaks. Or um, if I need to make a quick phone call during the day, I will. Um, and then I do a lot of stuff on the weekends as well. Uh, my partner uh, was in uh, consulting, IT consulting before and he left his job, and he's doing it full time. So he's responsible for a lot of our distrib for all of our distribution, and the day to day operational side of the business. And then he and I, I do all the marketing, I do all the uh, social media, all the the PR, um, and then he and I oversee the the overall business together uh, on a regular basis. I mean, we have bi weekly meetings, and we talk almost every day about everything so it's a very much a tag team effort so are there any plans for you uh to quit the finance business and go at the brewery full-time uh well if i if i had a choice the, the choice would have been made 
uh, 10 months ago when we opened. But, you know, right, right now that's one of those things that you have to sacrifice short term to, to make sure that the business succeeds long term. Um, I need to make sure that we can really, that we have enough money available, that we have enough cash flow, that we have enough cash balance on, on our balance sheet to make sure that we can pay people properly because I'm a, you know, we, we, there, even if I came on board and worked full time, we'd still have other people and other needs that we needed. And so I, we're a big believer in, in you have to pay people appropriately in order to keep, or keep them motivated to work hard. And so I wouldn't want to shortchange any of that. And, um, right now, I, you know, I see, we have the longer term picture here. So, so bigger picture, there is a plan in place down the road, but we need to really ramp things up more and, and get the company really, really stable and really, really um, moving before I start doing that. That that was and has been the idea all along. I mean, that was the motivation behind starting it. We said, what can we do so we can, what kind of business can we open so that we can both leave our jobs? And uh, the original plan was that we would both, figure out a point where the company had enough financial stability that we would each roll off and start taking a salary and do it full time. And as we were in the, the build out process, we realized that uh, it was going to be important for one of us to, to get going right away and, and be there every single day. And my partner, uh, he's a little bit older than I am. So he's He's had a little bit more work experience. He he, uh, he sort of looked at me and he said, I really need this. I need to do it first. So I, I want to do it. I can't really argue with a guy who, who's, who's doing that. And he took a, obviously took a lot of – he took a big financial hit from what he was making before. But he's so much happier now. And it's one of those things that I can't wait to when I do it because I think about it all the time. But it's just not um, – right now it's not in the best interest of the company to do that. So there are plans, but it's, uh, it's open-ended at this point. Awesome. So has there been any setback so far in Gun Hill or anything that's kind of slowed you guys down in your journey? Yeah. I mean, we, we had, we had setbacks from the very beginning. Uh, our equipment was, was delayed in, in arriving. Um, and then one of the, the issues with being in New York city is that there tends to be a lot of red tape when you're, when you're building stuff out. You need to have permits for everything and inspections upon inspections. And unfortunately, the, the power and utility company in New York City, is, is there's only one of them, really. Um, and so they move at their own pace. And we had, uh, we had, had to have a, an upgrade to our power our, and our, our gas and electric lines. And you needed inspections for all those, so those kept getting pushed back. And last winter, we had a really, really bad winter here. Uh, so obviously, they were, we were not a priority because people were without heat in their homes. And so those people, obviously, rightfully so, were getting pr- priority and preferential treatment. And so we just were – we kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And so we ended up opening probably about three or four months later than we originally in- expected. So that was obviously a setback. And then since we started brewing, um, the only setbacks we've had has just have just been that we didn't really um, we didn't have we haven't had enough kegs all throughout the entire process um, to really be able to do everything that we want to do. But it, it's not really been a setback because we're we're very happy with where we've been, what we've accomplished so far, and with uh, with. With the growth that we've seen from the supplies that we've had, but um, there were a couple of times where we we had stuff sitting in in our tanks that we were waiting to get out, and we just we couldn't get it out quite as um, in the volume that we wanted at the time that we wanted. So that that slowed us down a little bit, but that that was not a major setback. The major setback was opening four months later, just because you're wait, you're spending more money on rent and all this on salaries and all this stuff. But we've been very fortunate so far. We haven't had to dump any batches of beer or anything like that. So I'm sure all the homebrewers out there listening can feel my pain in the fact that I've had to throw away several batches of beer, which is absolutely devastating. But I want to know exactly how much beer you guys actually produce. It really varies because um, depends on whether or not we're brewing a seasonal beer or um, how much we need to brew 
uh, one of our flagship beers. So it really varies. There's, there's no set schedule or there hasn't been for year one. There will be more so for year two um, just because of natural or organic growth and, and some stuff that, that happened in, in the fall. Um, but it, we're on pace for, for, fiscal, for our fiscal year um, to, to brew probably just over 1,000 barrels for the first year. Um, and then we have eyes on, on trying to double that for next year. Wow. A thousand barrels. That is a lot of beer. And to put that into perspective, that is about 330,000 12 ounce bottles of beer. Now, at what point did you say to yourself, I got to make beer my business? As I mentioned earlier, I had been at this wedding and, and I, Thought the beer that my friend made was great, and we were uh, we were talking. And he he when he called me up and he said, you know, I I'm ready to to try and make this a, a full time job. And I said, okay, well, I know I can put you in touch with some people, and we can try and raise some money for you, and um, let's look into it. And then I said, but I have to be involved somehow. Like you got to let me help you out. And he said, okay, sure. And then he couldn't. Um, for some personal reasons, he couldn't leave his job anymore. And so, but my current partner, Kieran and I, we were playing, we were, it was during baseball season and I was telling him about it and he looked at me and he's like, I think we should really look into this some more. And so the, the three of us kept meeting and, and the more we started talking about the idea for the business and how it would all go, I started thinking like, this is a lot of potential and this could be a lot of fun and there's a real opportunity here. And the three of us couldn't ever actually agree on how we were going to structure it um, just because our, our other friend, the, the home brewer, needed a little bit more security than, than we felt comfortable giving in order for him to, to leave his job. And um, we kind of agreed to, to drop it in part ways and, and my current partner Kieran and I, we we sat there and we're like, we this is a, this is there's a real opportunity here. We shouldn't let this go. Let's go do this the right way and and run with this. Let's go hire a, a professional brewer and like really do this do this up and and let's go for it. So it was probably right around around that time. So that was about uh, around Thanksgiving of two thousand and twelve. So just over two years ago, and so from, I'd say from that point until when we actually opened was about fourteen months. Um, so we really, once we got the idea, and I said we got to do this, we put the pedal to the metal and really got everything done in a pretty timely manner. So would you say you've always had the entrepreneurial bone inside of you, or is this something you kind of just came across just? You know, randomly, you're at your buddy's wedding and he's making great beer. No, I would, I would always, I would say I've always had an entrepreneurial bone or entrepreneurial spirit in me. Um, I would always, when I was in college, I was always trying to think of of ways that I could, at some point in time, end up being my own boss. I mean, I, working in working in finance was was sort of a means to an ends and and more of a out of a ease and necessity than anything else because they that was just what was available through through where I went to college um, but it was always like and even when I first started working it was always what kind of business could I come up with that would be successful and could make a difference and that's what really is is the most important thing is when you're trying to come up with a with a business is you need to find something that hasn't been done or find a way that you can make something that has been done unique and I was not creative enough to to do that until I came across this idea about beer, and, and it just was very fortunate that New York and New York City was so far behind so much of the rest of the country. I mean, you go out west to where you are, and maybe not necessarily Arizona, but if you go out to, to obviously to California, you look at the city of San Diego, and you look at the population of San Diego, and you look at the size and the number of breweries that are in San Diego, and you compare that to what the population of New York City is, and the number of breweries we have here in, in the metro area that are servicing New York City, and it's like, this is a major opportunity because there's so many, there's so many fewer breweries here, and there's so many more people, so many more bars, 
And let's be honest, people people like to drink. And when you don't have to worry about driving in Manhattan or driving in the Bronx or any of that stuff, people drink more. And so it, it's um, that was it was just it was very, we were very very fortunate and very very lucky that that all this worked out the way that it did. You guys have a really awesome business model with being right there in the middle of the city and you know not having to worry about drinking and driving, which I'm actually a huge advocate on. And the fact that you can just jump in a cab and get to wherever you need to go, I mean, that's just awesome. That's boy. It's it, it's not even just that. You got the cab, which is which is great, but you also have we have a really good public transportation system here. So you near buses and near subways, and they pretty much take you anywhere you need to be in a really reasonable amount of time. And we're fortunate in our location. We're we're right near um, two subways, so. People can access us from all over the city, and we're near, as I mentioned earlier, a bunch of highways. So we're we're really accessible any way you come, and and that helps us from an on-site perspective. So we have people coming to our tasting room on a regular basis, and then it also helps us from a distributing standpoint because it's easier for us to get to a bunch of different areas of of New York and of the city um, because we're so close to highways and stuff. So it. It's it is being being in New York while it has its disadvantages because you have to deal with the red tape and a lot of the bureaucracy that comes with with being in the city. Um, you've got the the ease of transportation and the accessibility for for your consumers, which is great. With so few craft breweries there in New York, do any of these huge craft beer businesses like? Dogfish Head or Odell or New Belgium, do they have any impact on your company? You know, just how much beer you guys produce or, you know, finding the right demographic through marketing. Do they have any impact like that? It's not a fair comparison because they're on such a bigger level than we are right now. And I think, I don't, I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but the, that kind of model, that the regional brewery that Dogfish Head is, or the are bigger than regional brewery now, but but you know these regional breweries and these larger breweries, they're definitely something to shoot for 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 some of us. I mean, I think there are a lot of breweries that are that are here and just in general that are content servicing their their local area and being happy making you know whatever, however hundreds or or thousands of barrels they're making, and that's it. But to me, they're they're more an inspiration than 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 a, a hindrance right now because we're not we first of all we don't package our beer we don't do any bottling or canning right now so I'm not competing with shelf space with Dogfish Head I'm not competing with shelf space for Sam Adams um, and we don't we don't make a lot of the same type that we don't do a lot of the funky stuff that Dogfish Head does we don't do. The, the Boston, we don't do a lager like Boston Lager, so we're not competing with Boston Lager. So we're really, we're they're like the pioneers that help pave the way for us. And it's because some of these bars have had Sam Adams, they've had Dogfish Head 60 minute or 90 minute IPA that they're willing to try newer breweries. And it's opened up um, some bars that maybe five years ago never ever would have considered craft beer, but now they proudly have a sticker on their door. We serve craft beer here. And to them, craft beer is just Sam Adams or just Dogfish Head. But that's fine because it's it's they're more likely to try or be willing to try or be willing to engage in a conversation about um, serving more beer. So so they don't I wouldn't call them competition or, or prevent us from selling more beer yet. I would say that they are helping us right now open doors uh, to to selling more beer. Actually, that's great, and I've seen that a lot in the uh, the brewing community. Just you know, everybody just kind of helps each other out. You know, I don't think any of these big breweries are out there to monopolize the or corner the industry and just you know push everybody out. So, no, I, I don't. I don't think so either. I mean, I wouldn't. Say, I wouldn't say that they're actively out there trying to go. Well, what can we do to help the little guys out, or what can we do to try and, and make this better? They're obviously looking at their own um, their own interest and in, in trying to figure out what's best for their businesses. I mean, Sam Adams is going to do Boston Beer Company is going to be a billion dollar business this year, and that's unheard of in, in the in the craft beer industry right now. But um, I would agree with you that in general, the the, the craft beer industry is that everyone is looking to help each other out for the most part, um, as long as people buy into the the beer community. 
Um, but I wouldn't say that these guys are out there looking to try and, and say, oh, let's let's try and set this up for whatever. They're, they're definitely looking out for themselves as they should be, as they absolutely should be. But by doing that, there it has a trickle-down effect for the rest of us. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody is in business because they want to be, and they're out there to make money just the same as everybody else is. So, yes, absolutely, there is people doing big things, good things. And, and you're right. It does have a trickle down effect. And I've seen that and I've, I've heard about it more, you know, through talking through a lot of other brewers, which is, you know, just been a fantastic opportunity for me. And I just is fantastic opportunity for my listeners as well. But now let's lead into what's the next big thing for gun Hill. What's the new beer or, you know, new exciting event that's going to happen with gun Hill in the next you know year or so. Well, right now it's it's just to we're, we want to ramp up production a little bit more. Um, we we are really focusing on getting our two flagship beers, our uh, Golden Ale and our IPA, out into circulation more and more. Um, a, a lot of our seasonals sort of sell sell themselves. We're, our brewer is, uh, has a really renowned reputation for his stouts. Um, we actually won a gold medal at the GABF this past. October for one of our stouts. So our stouts sell themselves. A lot of our seasonals, we have customers that as soon as we have something out, they want them and they take them, they're gone. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to ramp up production and increase the visibility of our two flagship beers. And and we think that'll help because um, it, it's we just need to do that to take the next step and to start moving in the right direction and start building a base so that we can eventually look to to whether it be canning our beer or maybe doing limited bottle releases or something along those lines so that then we can hit a new market and and right now there's we're we're fortunate that we're in a lo- such a large area that we can really really still grow within the New York City and New- and greater New York area region um, before we even need to look at expanding into another state or states like New Jersey or Connecticut, which is right right on the border, um, but it, that that is in our you know that's something that we eventually wanted to look into as well. Great American Beer Festival winner, I got to know exactly what kind of stout did you guys brew and what what did you guys do special to win that? We uh, so we we actually. Um, the beer that we won our, our gold medal for, it's called Void of Light. It's a foreign style stout. Um, we, we first brewed that over the summer and we actually barrel aged our first batch of it in bourbon barrels. And we released that uh, in the early uh, part of September, late, uh, late August. And then we, we obviously re brewed the beer after we won our gold medal and we brewed it a couple times since. And we recently put um, this latest batch in some rye whiskey, some rum barrels, and another round of uh, bourbon barrels. So we, we're, we've got that, and that should be coming out probably um, right around, uh, I would guess now, the end of January. And then we just yesterday put our latest seasonal, which is a um, strong ale, into some Puerto Rican moonshine barrels, actually, from a, another it's a distillery in the Bronx. And we we have a good relationship with them, and we're putting this in their uh, Añejo barrels. So it, we're very, very excited to see what that's going to turn out with, like. Dang, you guys are really getting after it with uh, barrel aging. Not often have I seen anything other than maybe a bourbon barrel, rum barrel, or I've even heard of tequila barrel aging. But, you know, with the Puerto Rican moonshine, and you guys are just getting after it with these different types of alcohols that really soak into the beer, you know, the, the oak really – you know, resonates into the beer at that point. And I can only imagine you just the, uh, the flavors and the, the nose that you get out of a beer like that. Yeah. It's, uh, we just, it, no one else is doing anything like that. It, this is a, a very, uh, a very specific segment of the market. And we, and this beer that we brew, we thought it was perfect to complement to putting into a Bronx distilleries, uh, barrels because it's made with all this particular beer is made with exclusively New York grown hops, so it's uh, we thought it was a nice tie-in. Yeah, and you know, wasn't New York uh, you know earlier in like the 1800s with all the they had like 400 plus breweries in that area, and they were like the number one hops grower in the area. 
Yeah, and New York used to grow a ton of hops, um, and there were a ton of breweries in, in New York State and in New York City. Um, like each area of the city had its own brewery. So if you lived on the Upper East Side, you might have two breweries in the Upper East Side, one for a different area in the Upper East Side comprises like a uh, 30 to 40 block long area of the city for everyone who doesn't know. Um, but so there were there were tons of breweries. Um, and actually now what, what the, the state is doing is they're really trying to promote uh, the whole farm to table and, and local, locally grown, locally sourced movement. So they're putting incentives in place to try and bring back a lot of the hop farming that that we saw before. And obviously, just given the terrain where we are, there's only specific types of hops that are really going to thrive here. But even so, there's still enough need and demand that they can do very, very well. So we, we've seen a real influx uh, or increase of of hop farms in the last, call it. 18 to, to 24 months and there there's also a bunch more malt houses now that are that are up and coming in New York so they're really trying to to get on board and and back this this whole craft beer and craft spirits and movement that that we've seen elsewhere in the country Dave you've been killing it this first half of this interview and I can't wait to get started on the second half of this interview and with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to just throw at you some rapid-fire questions, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind on that. So let's go ahead and begin. Where do you see the future of craft beer? I, I see the, the future of craft beer continuing to grow, and people talk about saturation right now, and I don't think we're there. Um, I think that as more and more people learn about what is capable from a beer, we will see fewer and fewer people asking for the macro produced beers out there and you'll see I still think it it will become more and more localized so you won't necessarily see people clamoring across the country for something that's made here but I I see it becoming very very localized but increasing um even more from here What's one of the proudest moments you've had so far since opening Uh it's probably uh, winning the gold medal at the GABF just within, you know, we were only eight months old at the time, and we didn't necessarily expect to win anything, but to 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 actually medal and then to have it be a gold medal uh, has really been huge, huge for for our brewery, and and it was a very very proud moment because it sort of validated everything that that we thought we could accomplish, and and to do it in such a short period of time has has, has been great. Yeah, that's killer. You know, I mean, the Great American Beer Festival is, you know, just the one of, if not the biggest, brew festivals in America. I I think now it is the biggest festival in America. Yeah, I know. I know. I tried to buy tickets last year, and uh, they were sold out within like ten minutes. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you could choose one internet website to educate our listeners, what would it be, and why? Yeah, that's a that's a very tough one. Um, I think that for people that are looking to to sort of break into the industry, whether it be just uh, to work in the industry, to start up in the industry, I really think that probrewer.com is a great resource because it has a ton of information on there, but it also has um, a lot of, there's, I like to call it the, the Craigslist for, for breweries and for brewers because it has a ton of classifieds on there with people trying to sell equipment trying to buy equipment, trying to sell ingredients, trying to find jobs, in addition to all the um, instructional aspects of, of the site. So I think it's sort of a, an all-in-one site that, that is a great foundation for people. What is your favorite app or resource that you use to optimize your business? Um, do, do you mean that as like my favorite beer-related app or just any app in general? It doesn't necessarily have to be a beer related app like Beersmith or Beer Run. But you know, just something that really optimizes your business, makes your day to day life just a little bit easier. To be perfectly honest, I don't really use the only app that I that, that would be something like that that I would use that we use to optimize the business end is probably Google Drive. Um, just because that's right now how we, because of the size that we are, we use that to to manage a lot of our business, and that way it's easy for my partner and I to to share things um, no matter where we are because you can do it on the computer, but we also have it on our phones. Um, 
and so that would probably be the, the, the best. And also it's an easy way for us to share information with our, with our sales team. Um, and we actually use Google Drive as a way to pr put ad content to our website. So we do a lot through Google Drive. Um, it, we don't have the ability right now to, to be paying for any sort of uh, Salesforce system or anything like that. So, so we really rely on, on Google Drive a lot. And for everybody listening out there, you can find all these apps and resources on the show notes page after this episode. And with all the knowledge that you have now, and you could do it all over again, what would you do differently and why? Um, I, I think one of the things that I would do differently, well, one of the, the first thing I would do differently is I probably would have raised a little bit more money um, in the beginning. And I would have given, I would have made each share that we sold a little bit lower stake, just because there are always, always, always unforeseen delays that, that come into play, and, and something that you budget for that you think is is going to cost one thing ends up costing another, or just you think you need one thing, you buy it, and then all of a sudden you need something else in addition to it. Um, so, I, not that we we did a good job, we, we think we did a very good job giving our ourselves a cushion uh, from day one, but you can never have, I mean, that would be the one thing that I would stress to anyone out there is you can never have enough cash on, on your balance sheet and that, that cash is king. So if you, if you can't, if you don't have a cushion and you need it for a rainy day, that would be, that would probably be the, 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 the one thing I would do. And then one A I think I would do is um, I probably would have reached out to a few more people just to, to pick their brains a little bit more just to get a sense um, and to, to expedite a lot of process. Like, you know, we sat factions that I was talking about earlier and we finally reached out to someone and they said, oh, well, if you to help you expedite further, you should call this person. And it was like as soon as we called that person, stuff started happening and could have saved ourselves a lot of time, a lot of grief and a lot of money had I, you know, picked up the phone and thought to ask or gotten in touch with someone earlier. So uh, those are the, probably the, the two things I would have done differently. Dave, first off, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to be here with us on the Brewing Business Podcast. You've just dropped so much knowledge in all of us, and I have to say it again, you killed it on this interview. And with that, I'm sure everybody out there is wondering how they can best contact you, and then we're going to say goodbye. Um, anyone can feel free to, to email me. Uh, my email address is Dave, D-A-V-E, at gunhillbrewing.com, uh, G-U-N-H-I-L-L, brewing, B-R-E-W-I-N-G.com. Um, and I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions and, and sort of see where where it goes from there. And then the only other advice I, I would have is that if, if it's – if everyone, if you have a passion for something, or whether it be beer or something else – you gotta just you gotta go for it, um, and, and it, you have to take risks in order to uh, to 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 make yourself happy. I think in the long term, and not everything is uh, as cut and dry as it sometimes seems. Great, Dave, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show, and we will catch you later. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, please go to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review Brewing Business. And you can connect with me through the Brewing Business website, brewingbusinesspc.com, and on Twitter at Tim Nichols on Tap. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>